In this video I would like to explain the physics concerning electrostatic fields. Around 550 before Christ, Thales of Miletus made a series of observations on static electricity. He found that amber was attracting objects like a feather after rubbing that piece of fossilized tree resin with wool, I am using a piece of drapery. A simple experiment using modern materials illustrates that phenomenon more precisely. A plastic strap is rubbed with a piece of paper and balanced on the tip of a wire. If a glass rod is rubbed with the same paper strap, a repelling force can be observed between both objects. When using amber instead of glass, there is an attracting force between both materials. Today we know that electrons are exchanged between different materials when rubbing two objects. Miletus coined the new Latin word electricius from the Greek word for amber. It is obvious that there are different types of charge, known as positive and negative charge. Charles Augustin de Coulomb used a more precise type of a torsion balance than I have built to analyze the interaction between charged objects more precisely and published his findings in 1785, which are nowadays known as Coulomb's Law. He discovered that the magnitude of the electrostatic force of interaction between two point charges is directly proportional to the scalar multiplication of the magnitudes of charges and inversely proportional to the square of the distance between them. If the two charges have the same sign, the electrostatic force between them is repulsive, if they have different sign, the force between them is attractive. Some later in this video we will see why there is a constant K used in the equation. To keep the math simple, charges are mostly treated as very tiny objects, strictly speaking as point charges. In the animation sequences of this video, I am using discs with a certain diameter, where the charge is located at the center of the circle. In the coordinate system shown here, the force between two positive point charges, each being one microcoulomb in magnitude, is plotted over the distance in meters. The resulting force is less than 0.14 mN above 8 meters, and it is increasing with decreasing distance. We get 0.56 mN at 4 meters. 2.24 mN at 2 meters, and more than 40 mN at a distance of just half a meter. The force grows to infinity when the distance tends to zero. The graph is mirrored along the y axis. Thus, the repulsive force between both particles is also increasing if the charge is approaching from the left side. The square value of R, which is x2 minus x1, is part of the equation, hence we get positive values for the resulting force even if x2 becomes negative. Furthermore, in physics, the distance is given by the absolute value of the difference between two points on the x-axis. Here you can see a three-dimensional plot visualizing the force on a second charge in each point of the XZ plane, with the first charge placed in the point of origin. The resulting grid is similar to an upended cone with its tip at the Y axis. I will truncate the tip to give you a better view on the area representing the magnitude of the force. In doing so, values below a minimal distance are discarded. Nevertheless, the charge is treated as a point charge placed in the XZ plane at the center of the red disc. With growing distance from the charge placed in the point of origin, the grid representing the force gets closer to the XZ plane. 
Let's go back to a two-dimensional illustration of a positive point charge. The field surrounding the charged particle at the center of the drawing, usually named source charge, is examined by using another charge, named test charge. The distance between both particles is given by the subtraction of their position vectors. The vectorial notation of Coulomb's law is more simple when placing the source charge at the point of origin, so that R1 becomes zero. For each point in space around the first charge, we can calculate a force vector with an appropriate magnitude and direction acting on the second charge. The direction is given by R2, pointing away from the source charge at the center of the illustration to the second particle. The magnitude of the resulting force is proportional to the length of the force vectors, drawn as green arrows. As seen before and given by Coulomb's law, the force is growing with smaller distance and it becomes infinite if R2 tends to zero. Vice versa there is, the longer R2, the shorter the resulting force vector. Forces always occur in pairs, hence every force action on one object is accompanied by a reaction on another, of equal magnitude but opposite direction. To get the reaction on charge number 1, we have to subtract position vector R2 from R1. Since the first charge is still placed at the point of origin, the resulting vector is minus R2. We get a force vector with same magnitude but opposite direction, starting at the point of origin. There is no change in magnitude or direction when using two negative charges, each with a value of minus one microcoulomb instead of two positive ones. Minus one microcoulomb times minus one microcoulomb is equal to plus one microcoulomb times plus one microcoulomb. The situation changes if a positive and a negative charge are used instead. Now, all force vectors are pointing to the source particle placed at the point of origin, no matter if the first or the second particle is plus one microcoulomb. We get always a negative value for the resulting force, indicating that it is acting contrary to position vector R2. Let's go back to the situation with the charge of plus one microcoulomb at the center of the drawing. By Coulomb's law, the force acting on a second charge is defined in all points in space. When dividing the Coulomb force by the magnitude of the second charge, we get the electric field due to the first charge at the center of the illustration. The magnitude of the electric field in a point in space is equivalent to the force acting on a second particle with a charge of one coulomb, therefore the dimension of the electric field is force per charge, thus Newton per coulomb. The electric field can be thought of as a function that associates a vector with every point in space, considering the magnitude and the direction. The magnitude of the electric field is constant in all points with constant length or the distance vector. Just half the quantity of charge in the center results in half the electric field in all points in space surrounding it, hence the force detected on a test charge is halved too. Field lines are often used to visualize the direction of force acting on a test charge due to an electric field. A single field line illustrates the path of a positive test charge without mass moving in an electric field. At the animation, the movement starts to the right of the positive source charge. The force exerted on the test charge is pointing straight away from the source charge located at the point of origin. Let's move the test charge slightly into that direction and recalculate the force. 
once again, the resulting vector points straight away from the source charge. An infinite number of iterations gives a single field line extended between the source charge at the center of the illustration and infinity. We get the field line pattern of a positive point charge when choosing different starting points. Since there is an infinite number of starting points, there is also an infinite number of field lines. Because drawing large quantities of field lines reduces the readability of the pattern, the number of field lines is usually limited. These lines are not physical lines that are actually present at certain locations, field lines are merely visualization tools. The direction of a field line is defined by the movement of a positive test charge, thus the lines are pointing away from the positive source charge. Field lines are not limited to a two-dimensional plane. The three-dimensional plot illustrates the field lines below and above the XY plane, which are also pointing straight away from the source charge to infinity. The field line pattern of a negative charge is just slightly different from that of a positive charge. The positive test charge is attracted by the negative charge at the center of the drawing. Consequently, the vectors of the electric field point to the source charge, which is why the field lines are running from infinity to the negative charge. Let's have a look at the field line pattern of two different charges. The force acting on a test charge due to a system of point charges is simply the vector addition of the individual forces acting alone on that test charge due to each one of the charges. Considering that the electric field vector is the force vector divided by the magnitude of the test charge, we get two field vectors, each caused by one of the two source charges. The two vectors can be added in head-to-tail fashion to determine the resultant or net electric field vector at that location. Using this principle, known as the law of superposition, we get the electric field vector at any given location surrounding the charges. All vectors at the right half of the illustration are pointing to the negative charge, while those at the left half are pointing away from the positive charge. Along the Y axis, the vectors are pointing in parallel to the X axis. Using the law of superposition, we can compute the field line pattern. Once again, the electric field at a given point is calculated and the test charge is moved along the resulting direction. The positive charge at the left of the illustration is the starting point of all field lines. We get a very rough approximation when using a large step width for each iteration. The smaller the step width, the closer the simulation to the real path of a massless test charge. Almost all field lines are curved, running from the positive to the negative charge. The electric field vectors point tangent to the direction of the field lines at any given point. Same as the electric field vectors, the field lines illustrate the direction of a force acting on a positive test charge. Two field lines are not running from the positive to the negative charge. If the starting point of the test charge is set exactly to the left of the positive charge, the resulting vector of the electric field points away from both charges. Same as for a single positive charge, that field line runs straight away to infinity. The field line to the right of both charges runs from infinity to the negative charge along the X axis. Computing the three-dimensional field line pattern is done in the same way. 
The paths of all field lines are rotationally symmetric to the connection axis between both charges. Next I would like to explain the electric potential energy, resulting from the Coulomb force treated before. Work is done whenever a force is needed to move the test charge. No force is needed to move that massless particle perpendicularly to the direction of the field line starting at the source charge. Now, the Coulomb force points perpendicularly to the direction of movement, the resulting path is a circuit with the source charge at its center. What happens if the distance between both charges is right? The magenta colored vector illustrates the force needed to lower the distance between test and source charge from 6 to 3 meters. The repulsive force acting on the test charge due to the electric field of the source charge is painted as green vector. Work is done, thus the electric potential energy of the system is rising. The work done by a constant force of magnitude F on a point that moves the displacement S in the direction of the force is simply F times S. As we already know, the Coulomb force acting on the test charge due to the field of the source charge will rise with distance. The amount of energy applied to the system of the two positive charges is represented by the area between start and end point of the movement below the graph illustrating the Coulomb force. The resulting energy is given by the integral of the function between starting and end point of movement. When enlarging the distance between both charges, the force acting on the test charge is pointing into the direction of movement, length and direction of the green and magenta colored vectors are identically. Energy is extracted from the system. As soon as the distance between both charges reaches the initial state, the amount of energy extracted from the system is identically to that applied to the system while the particles approached, except the sign. The graph representing the force acting on the test charge and so the area below the curve did not change during the process. The energy of the system resulting from the Coulomb force, thus from the distance between both point charges is named electrostatic potential energy. The electric potential at a point of space is the amount of electrostatic potential energy that a unitary point charge would have when located at that point, taking an infinite separation between the charges as the reference position. Work has to be done in order to move the test charge from infinity to distance R in the presence of the source charge. Thus, energy is applied to the system composed of the two point charges during this process. Instead of the force acting on a test charge, each point in space surrounding the source charge can also be described by the electrostatic potential energy at that point. The electrostatic potential energy depends on the quantity of charge accumulated in the source charge located at the point of origin and denoted as Q1 as well as the magnitude of the test charge denoted as Q2. If the distance between both charges tends to zero, the electric potential energy tends to infinity. The electric potential energy due to the point charge Q1 at a distance R with Q2 set to 1 Coulomb is named electric potential or simply potential. The graphs of the animation don't vary when changing Q2 from 1 microcoulomb to 1 Coulomb because the units at the Y axis are changed in the same way, the force is now displayed in KN, the energy in KJ. The unit of the electrostatic potential is Joule per Coulomb, thus we would get KJ per Coulomb at the Y axis of the animation. With the electrostatic potential, a scalar value is associated to every point in space around a charged particle. 
Contrary to the force vectors used so far, the electrostatic potential is a scalar field. By definition of R, we get positive values for the potential even if the test charge is approaching from the left side, thus the graph is mirrored along the Y axis. The three dimensional animation displays the electrostatic potential over all points of the XZ plane with the source charge at the point of origin. Same as in the two dimensional illustration, the potential tends to zero with increasing distance, the grid representing the potential is close to the XZ plane, however if the distance tends to zero, the potential tends to infinity. Once again, I will cut the tip of the cone, thus the potential is computed only up to a minimal distance. The work done when moving a test charge from infinity to a point in an electric field due to a source charge is independent from the path taken to reach that point. The orange colored sphere representing the potential energy of the test charge is lifted to the same height, no matter what path the test charge chooses from infinity to the end point. Taking path number 1, the sphere is lifted constantly. Thus, the potential energy of the system is continuously rising. On the second path, the sphere is lifted above the level of the endpoint by what additional energy is needed. That surplus of energy is released when the sphere rolls downhill to the endpoint of movement. In sum, the same amount of energy was applied to the system. If the test charge is moving along a circular path with the source charge at the center, the height of the orange colored sphere is kept constant, energy is not stored in the system, nor is it removed. The distance between both charges is kept constant at all points of the circular path, thus there is no change in electrostatic potential energy. A path of constant scalar potential, which is a constant height over the XZ plane in the animation is named equipotential line. Multiple lines of that type can be drawn on the potential grid. The difference in height between two points on the grid representing the potential is named voltage and it is equal to the work done per unit charge when moving that charge between the two points against the static electric field. The electrostatic potential is equal to the voltage between two points in the electrostatic field with a reference potential such as ground used as one of the points. At this illustration of the potential grid, the reference point is at infinity, where the electric field is zero. In course of this video we will examine arrangements of charged particles with a potential of zero joule per coulombs in a finite distance to those particles. The voltage between all points of two equipotential lines is constant, Remember that there is no difference in height on the three dimensional area along each of that path. Equipotential lines are usually drawn in such a way that there is a fixed difference in electric potential between two nearby paths. At the top view, the distance between the concentric circles seems to shrink when going from infinity to the source charge. This view angle is commonly used for two dimensional illustrations of equipotential lines in an electric field. We also get circular paths when computing the equipotential lines of a negative charge. The resulting three dimensional area is a cone with its tip pointing downward. Since the negative source charge is attracting the positive test charge, the potential is decreasing with decreasing distance between the particles. Energy is removed from the system whenever the sphere representing the potential energy of the test charge rolls downhill to the negative source charge, 
but work has to be done in order to raise the distance between both charges. Whenever the sphere is moved along an equipotential line, there is no change in electric potential energy. With decreasing distance, the potential tends to negative infinity, while it tends to zero with increasing distance. In contrast to the previous illustration using a positive source charge, all points of the potential grid are now below the XZ plane. Let's go back to a positive source charge... ...and shift the position of the particle to the left along the X-axis. When fading in a negative charge next to the positive one, all points of the potential grid are pulled at least slightly to the bottom. The animation stops as soon as the absolute value of the negative charge equals that of the positive charge. The field line pattern of two different charges has been computed before. Same as the electric field, the electric potentials are superposable. The electric potential generated by a set of charges distributed in space is the scalar sum of the potentials generated by each charge taken in isolation. All points on the resulting potential grid located to the left of the Z axis are still above the XZ plane, however the potential to the right of the Z axis is now below the zero level. The equipotential lines painted in red belong to a positive potential, while those painted in blue belong to a negative potential. The top view illustrates that the paths are no longer concentric rings, only close to the charges the equipotential lines are almost circular. Both charges have the same magnitude and the arrangement is mirrored along the Z-axis, thus the three-dimensional grid representing the potential intersects with the XZ-plane along that axis. In contrast to all other equipotential lines, the one representing a potential of zero joule per coulomb is not a closed loop and there is a finite distance to both charges. Starting at almost all points of the potential area, the sphere representing the potential energy of the test charge moves away from the positive charge and to the sink of the negative charge. The red sphere representing the test charge moves along a field line in the XZ plane. Energy is needed to invert the process. Now, the test charge is moved closer to the positive charge, thus, work has to be done and energy is stored in the system. When set to a point on the X-axis to the left of the positive charge, the sphere moves straight away from both charges to infinity. As we saw before, all points on the potential grid are pulled downward when fading in a negative charge. The area moves upward during the reverse process. What happens if the distance between both charges is lowered? When having a close look at some points on the potential grid, each with a fixed distance to one of the charges, you can see that the potential at all of them tends to zero if the charges approach. If they depart, the potential is increasing to the left of the arrangement center and it is decreasing to the right. Consequently, the gradient of the potential grid in the space between the two charges is increasing with decreasing distance, while the plane is flattened at the outside. At the reverse process shown here, the grid gets flattened at the space between the particles. When the particles approach, the absolute values of the difference in potential between two points at the inside is increasing while it is decreasing at the outside. 
the electric field at the outside is more and more neutralized when the charges approach. Mathematically, the distance between two point charges can be set to zero, by what the potential at the outside is cancelled out, while it tends to infinity in the space between both charges. Shape and position of the equipotential lines also indicate the weakening of the electric field at the outside and the boosting in the space between the particles. In the three-dimensional plot... ...as well as in the two-dimensional illustration. The area enclosed by each path is shrinking when the charges approach... ...and it is growing when they depart. As treated before, the potential is derived from the electric field. Thus, the electric field is decreasing at the outside and increasing in the space between the charges if the particles approach. According to today's state of knowledge, the sum of all positive and negative charges in our universe is very likely zero, there is a negative charge to each positive charge. Caused by the Coulomb force, differently charged particles surrounding us are mostly close to each other, thus we can't detect electric fields. In order to create a noticeable electric field, the distance between different charges has to be enlarged, by what work has to be done. At the animation shown here, a negatively charged particle is pulled to the right and its positively charged counterpart is pulled to the left, by what the electric field surrounding the particles is increasing. It is decreasing in the space between the particles while they depart. Rerunning this process with some more charged particles and concentrating the charges with same sign in a small volume boosts the electric field in all points in space. Additional energy is needed to overrun the repelling forces between the charges. Let's rearrange the particles in two chains placed in parallel. All electric field vectors in the core area between the particles are now pointing to the right. The longer the chains of charged particles become, the clearer the effect. A test charge located in the core area of the arrangement is pulled to the right. The magnitude of the force acting on the test charge represented by the length of the green vector will rise significantly. We get a variation of 51% in the area enclosed by the green path. That variation in magnitude is larger along the yellow path, running to the edges of the arrangement. We get up to 67%. Furthermore, there is a clear deviation from the horizontal alignment of the force vector at the top and the bottom of this path. So let's place additional rows of charged particles above and below the existing ones. The length of the electric field vectors at the core of the arrangement doesn't vary significantly any longer. Now, the computed variation of the force acting on the test charge along the core path is just 23%. Because of the increasing number of charges surrounding the test charge, the magnitude of the force acting on the particle increased in all points in space. 
the variation along the yellow path is just 48%, nevertheless there is still a clear deviation from the horizontal alignment at the top and the bottom of this area. Let's lower the distance between the two plates composed of charged particles. As expected, the electric field is increasing in the space between the plates. The force acting on the test charge is increasing accordingly. Now, the variation along the green path is only 13%. An electric field with all vectors having the same magnitude and pointing into the same direction is named uniform field. Consequently, magnitude and direction of the force acting on a test charge placed in a uniform field are invariant in all points in space. An ideal uniform electric field is set up between two parallel plates with infinite dimensions that are oppositely charged, carrying a uniform charge per unit area. As demonstrated in the animated sequence, the electric field is nearly uniform between two plates with finite dimensions. Simply keep the distance between the plates small in comparison to their size. Charge quantization is the principle that the charge of any object is an integer multiple of the elementary charge. The electric charge of a single electron is minus 1.602 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs, which is the smallest unit for a negative charge carried by an isolated particle. In order to raise the negative charge of a volume in space, the number of electrons enclosed by that volume has to be increased. The volume's charge is not increasing continuously, but in integer multiples of the elementary negative charge. For each electron inside a neutral atom, there is a proton carrying a positive elementary charge of plus 1.602 times 10 to minus 19 coulombs. The most simple type of an atom is hydrogen, composed of a single proton at the nucleus and one electron in its shell. Besides the electrostatic force, there are more effects to be considered when describing the structure of an atom. I will simply treat atoms as an arrangement of protons and electrons that don't fall below a minimal distance. The positive charge of the nucleus is shielded by the electron moving around the atom's shell. That movement makes the electron shell appear as if the charge of the electron is blurred around the atom. Similar mechanisms cause the formation of molecules, with fixed spacings between the atom's nuclei. If a molecule is composed of different types of atoms, the charge of the electron shell is not distributed evenly around the nuclei. There is more than electrostatic effects that cause the formation of molecules, but for now I would like to keep the model simple. Let's treat molecules as an arrangement of positive charges at the core, with the negative charge blurred unevenly around it, not under running a minimal distance. In the simple case of two point charges with a fixed spacing, one with charge minus Q and the other one with charge plus Q, there is an electric dipole moment acting on the formation. The arrangement is named electric dipole, where D is the displacement vector pointing from the negative to the positive charge. The electric dipole moment is increasing with increasing magnitude of the charges, as well as with increasing space between the particles. The unit of the electric dipole moment is Coulomb times meter, or short, Coulomb meter. An object with an electric dipole moment is subject to a torque when placed in an external electric field. The dipole is rotating in such a way that the displacement vector is pointing into the direction of the electric field vectors. 
The torque is at its maximum if the axis of the dipole is perpendicular to the direction of the electric field and it becomes zero if the axis is in parallel to those vectors. The external field is weakened in the space between the particles of the dipole, while it is boosted to the left and to the right of the arrangement. Let's have a look at a simple model of a water molecule, composed of three particles arranged in an angle of 105 degrees, with the magnitude of the negative charge at the top being equal to the sum of the two positive charges at the bottom. To get the electric dipole moment, the center of positive charge has to be calculated first. In this case it is located in the midpoint between both positive charges. The displacement vector points from the center of the negatively charged particle to the center of positive charge. The electric dipole moment will rise with the angle between the charges. At an angle of 180 degrees, the electric dipole moment is cancelled out, because the center of the positive charges is congruent to the center of the negative charge. In this animation sequence, the upper molecules rotate around their z-axis, while the lower ones don't. The yellow vectors illustrate the vertical component of the total forces acting between the molecules. As you can see, the electrostatic forces acting on the molecules to the left of the screen are significantly larger than those between the linear molecules without an electric dipole moment drawn to the right. The melting point of water molecules with a net dipole moment of 6.18 times 10 to minus 30 Coulomb meter is 0 degrees, while that of linear built carbon dioxide is minus 56 degrees Celsius. When an external electric field is applied to a body without a permanent dipole moment, the distance between protons and electrons the object is made of can change. At this very abstract model of an atom, the electron shell gets distorted due to the uniform external field, thus the center of negative charge is separated from that of the positive charge, a process referred to as distortion polarization. As you might already have noticed, the dimensions and the magnitude of charge this model is based on don't belong to real atoms. Taking the definition of the electric dipole moment into account, the model atom is dumped down to an arrangement of two charges with an appropriate displacement. There is a feedback between distortion polarization and the external field. With increasing external electric field, the distance between both charges is increasing too. Vice versa, the dipole moment tends to zero if the external field fades out. Once again I am using multiple charges arranged in two plates to create a nearly uniform electric field in this animation sequence. A chain of neutral atoms is placed at the center of the formation. With increasing electric field, the negative charges of the atoms are pulled to the positive plate at the left of the arrangement, while the positive charges are pulled into the opposite direction. An additional electric field is generated by the polarized atoms that interacts with the external uniform field. As mentioned before, the electric field is superposable, thus the resulting field is computed by vector addition of the external field and that caused by the induced dipoles. In the space between the displaced charges, the electric field vectors caused by the distortion polarization are pointing into the opposite direction of the external field, the uniform field is weakened. To the left and to the right of the dipoles, the external field gets boosted, the vectors are pointing into the same direction.
materials made of molecules with a permanent electric dipole moment interact with external electric fields too. In the absence of an external electric field, the dipoles have any orientation with respect to the other ones, so that in sum the electric field is cancelled out, at least in a distance to the surface of the material. If a uniform electric field is applied to the arrangement, a torque is acting on each dipole, which is why the particles start rotating in such a way that they get aligned in parallel to the vectors of the external field. Analogical to distortion polarization, there is a feedback between the field of the dipoles and the external field. Outside of the material, the electric field of the dipoles boosts the external field, the vectors of both fields point into the same direction. The influence of matter like air on an electric field and so on the force acting between charges is related by the Coulomb constant mentioned at the beginning of this video. The Coulomb constant is composed of pi and the relative permittivity of the material, usually denoted by the Greek letter epsilon. The vacuum permittivity isn't zero, but 8.854 times 10 to minus 12 ampere seconds per voltmeter. The relative permittivity reflects the effects of a material on an electric field compared to the field in vacuum. We get 1.00059 for gaseous air and, caused by the dipole moment and the higher density, 80 for liquid water. If a positive charge is brought near to an atom or molecule, a dipole is formed due to distortion polarization. The dipole's center of negative charge is pulled to the right, where the positively charged particle is located. In sum, there is a force acting on the molecule pointing to the second particle. The lower the distance between both objects, the larger the effect. The redistribution of electrical charge in an object caused by the influence of nearby charges is named electrostatic induction. This effect causes the attraction between light, non-conductive objects, such as styrofoam scraps, and charge objects, such as the electrically charged glass rod. At the beginning of this video I demonstrated the mutual force action between a charged and a neutral object using a very simple torsion balance. In this animation sequence, the metal sphere is illustrated as a cross section through a hollow sphere. The movement of the mobile electrons is caused by the force exerted by the electric field of the charged object to the right. The attractive forces between the conduction electrons and the positively charged metal ions of the metallic bonding are neglected in the animation sequence. As the electrons are moving to the right, the sphere turns into a macroscopic dipole, thus it is attracted by the charged object to the right of the illustration. Electrostatic induction is a redistribution of electrical charge in an object caused by the influence of nearby charges. This mechanism creates forces acting on an object whenever it is applied to an electric field. Let's have a look at some more field line patterns. The next pattern being computed using the law of superposition is that of two positive charges. Same as for a single positive charge, almost all field lines start at one of the particles running to infinity. There are two exceptions from the rule, both starting at the connection line between the charges. The left field line starts at the left particle and runs to the center of the arrangement. The magnitude of the electric field due to the left charge is identically to that of the right charge, 
but both vectors are pointing contrary to each other. The resulting force acting on the test charge is exactly zero. The very same situation occurs when starting at the right charge. There are two field lines with a finite length that don't end at a negative charge. As said before, the number of field lines is infinite, thus only some lines are drawn to illustrate the direction of the vector field. In order to also depict the magnitude, a selection of field lines is often drawn such that the density of field lines at any location is nearly proportional to the magnitude of the vector field at that point. In doing so, some of the lines in the drawing have to be removed, or else the density of field lines near the vertical center line is clearly higher than the magnitude of the electric field. Even now, the density of field lines is just a very rough approximation of the effective magnitude of the electric field. The magnitude at the center of the arrangement is indeed zero as indicated by the field line density, but it is clearly different from zero close to the two charges. I prefer drawing the field lines in such a way that there is a constant angle between two starting points at a positive charge. When doubling the magnitude of the left charge, the field line pattern changes. The number of field lines starting at a positive charge is proportional to its magnitude, twice as much field lines exit the left particle. As we saw before, no force is needed to move a test charge along an equipotential line, consequently, those lines intersect with the field lines at an angle of 90 degrees. Same as the paths of the field lines, the pattern of equipotential lines is axially symmetric if both positive charges have the same magnitude. This is the three-dimensional plot of the potential area due to the two positive point charges located in the XZ plane. When having a close look at the center of the arrangement, you can see that the potential is rising towards both charges, but falling perpendicularly to the connection line. Only if the test charge is moving along the x-axis, the orange colored sphere representing the potential energy of the test charge is moving down to the midpoint. As soon as the test charge is placed slightly below that midpoint, the sphere rolls downhill, moving along the z-axis. If there are three positive charges arranged at the peaks of an equilateral triangle, we get the field line pattern shown here. Several field lines starting in an angular range of approximately 20 degrees at each particle converge at the center of the formation. A test charge placed somewhere in that area is following the path of a field line to the center point. The force acting on the test charge is always pointing into the area outlined by those special field lines. That characteristic of the electric field generated by the three positive charges is hard to observe at the potential grid, only the equipotential lines at the center of the arrangement illustrate the existence of a sink. The effect is obvious if nine positive charges are placed in a circular formation. There is a local minimum of potential energy at the center of the arrangement and the sphere rolls to the midpoint as soon as it crosses the potential well surrounding that minimum. A negative charge also causes a sink in the potential energy surface, but the local minimum of this arrangement is above negative infinity and also above the zero level. The energy needed to move the test charge into the area of that local minimum must exceed the potential energy at the lowest point of the well surrounding the center of the arrangement. 
The potential well computed for this animation sequence exists only in case the test charge is moving in the XZ plane. As illustrated by the field line pattern, a test charge inside of the circle moves to the midpoint when placed in the XZ plane. Let's rotate the arrangement so that the viewing angle points to the edge. All field lines exiting the charges even slightly above or below the XZ plane are running away from the midpoint of the circle. This arrangement is useless to capture a charged particle in a 3 dimensional world, thus it is an improper ion trap. The grid of electric field vectors illustrates that the force acting on a test charge tends to zero when moving to the midpoint of the circle. If some more charges are arranged on a spherical shell, the electric field inside of the arrangement is decreasing, even though the number of charges increased. If multiple charges are spread evenly on the spherical shell, the electric field inside of the holosphere tends to zero. While the spherical shell is built in the animated sequence, the vectors representing the electric field are shrinking inside of the arrangement while they are growing at the outside. When fading out the spheres above and below the XZ plane to give you a clear insight, the effect becomes obviously. There is almost no force acting on a charged particle enclosed by the sphere, this arrangement is also useless as an ion trap. All vectors outside the holosphere are pointing away from the center of the arrangement. The electric field is identical to that of a point charge located at the center. Length or direction of the vectors outside of the holosphere don't change when the radius of the sphere is shrinking. Let's go back to the field line pattern of two positive charges. The equipotential lines enclosing both particles are oval at the center of the illustration and they become circular with growing distance from the charges. From a distant view, there is almost no difference to a pattern caused by a single charge placed at the center of the drawing. All field lines are pointing straight away from the center of the arrangement, remember that it's up to you which field lines to paint. With a distant view, the two charges appear to be one charge. The smaller the distance between the two charges, the clearer the effect becomes. The equipotential lines in the two-dimensional drawing become equipotential surfaces in a three-dimensional illustration. In case of computing the equipotential surface of two positive charges, the resulting grids are rotation symmetric. The two surfaces merge to a single one with growing distance. The larger the distance, the more ball shaped the equipotential surface becomes. Same as the lines in the two dimensional drawing, the equipotential surface is almost identically to that of a single point charge at its center. As mentioned before, the elementary charge is the electric charge carried by a single proton. A proton is not a fundamental particle. It is composed of three quarks, one down quark with a charge of minus one third... ...and two up quarks with a charge of plus two third of the elementary charge. At the animation shown here, the down quark is surrounded by the two up quarks, thus 
the negative charge is shielded by the two positively charged particles. With growing distance, the electric field is nearly equal to that of a single positive point charge. The field lines are running straight away from the center of the formation and the equipotential lines are nearly circular in a distance being approximately 2.2 times the radius of the proton. The negatively charged down quark is shielded by a potential well. The closer the distance between the particles, the higher the well becomes. The equipotential lines point out the shape of the potential energy surface. Work has to be done in order to move a positive charge close to the proton. When lowering the distance between the quarks to zero, the potential energy surface equals that of a single positive charge. In doing so, all equipotential lines are turned into circular paths, position and shape of the outermost path changes just slightly. More work has to be done in order to move the test charge to the same point in space at the XZ plane, because the potential increased due to the rearrangement of the quarks. The difference in potential is marginal at the points far away from the center. In order to discover the structure of protons, a test charge has to be brought close enough to a proton, so that there is a clear difference in potential compared to that of a point charge. In fact, the charge of a proton is just plus 1.602 times 10 to minus 19 coulomb, but the radius of the particle is also very small, namely just 1.7 times 10 to minus 15 meters. The energy needed to bring two protons to a distance of 3.4 times 10 to minus 50 meters, which is two times the radius of a proton, equals 69 times 10 to minus 15 joules. That is equal to 0.43 mega electron volt, a unit of energy commonly used in atom physics, and it is the energy measured in megajoule divided by the elementary charge. Considering classical mechanics, a particle with a mass of 1.673 times 10 to minus 27 kilograms needs a speed of approximately 9000 km per second to get the same amount of kinetic energy. That's one of the reasons why large colliders are needed to discover the structure of tiny particles. With a proton diameter of zero, the resulting potential is independent from the orientation of the quarks considering this very simple model. We get the potential energy due to two point charges. If a charge moves around, the electric field surrounding the particle changes over time. The variation of the electric field propagates through space with light speed. The faster the movement of the particle compared to light speed, the stronger the divergence to a static electric field. Electromagnetism, which will be treated in a subsequent video, results from moving charges. Additional information about electrostatics is available on the project page. Thanks for watching and I'll be back!